One of the good things of going on an academic exchange is you get to see how other universities structure the way they teach. Like, in Dublin, the history department was only allowed to teach from the Middle Ages onwards. Everything before then was the domain of the classics department. But when I went to San Diego, I found that antiquity now also fell into the remit of history. And I know that this may sound like a very nerdy little detail, but I've always been interested in the ancient Greeks and Romans, so I was definitely going to take this opportunity. Also, a few months into my exchange, the whole world shut down. It was March 2020, and I didn't have anything else to do, so I inscribed in a class on the decline of Rome. Our professor, Edward J. Watts, was doing research for a book he was about to publish, now available under the title The Eternal Decline and Fall of Rome, The History of a Dangerous Idea. It was all about how people who spoke about Rome being on the decline, especially people who were living in ancient Rome, made use of this rhetoric to legitimize political agendas which aimed at changing the status quo of Roman society or politics. Think dictators like Sulla, who spoke about Romans having lost their way right after he won a civil war and started chopping off the heads of his enemies. The book basically followed all the people who made this argument, starting around 200 BC and going all the way into the early modern era. For most of the semester, I was thoroughly intrigued by the subject matter, but it wasn't anything groundbreaking for me. Enough to keep me busy while I was locked in my dorm and my friends had all gone home, but nothing to quite rock the boat. Until we came to the year 476. I knew the story. It was the year when Western Rome fell, when antiquity ended, and the Middle Ages began. In the East, the Byzantine Empire continued to exist until it was conquered by the Ottomans in 1453. But the story that my professor told was different. In 476, the last Western Roman emperor, Romulus Augustulus, was deposed by Odoaca and exiled to the countryside in Campania as a chicken farmer. Odoaca was one of the many barbarian, or more specifically Germanic, mercenary commanders which were hired by the Romans to support their armed forces. In 476, Odoacer and Romulus Augustulus' father, Orestes, clashed over the distribution of land to the soldiers. Orestes refused to give them what they wanted, so by promising to find them the land they desired, Odoacer won over the army and rebelled against Orestes. After killing him and deposing Romulus Augustulus, Odoacer took the insignia of power from the youthful emperor and sent them to Constantinople, where he told the court that he would rule in the name of the Eastern Roman Emperor. Odoacer argued that there was no more need for two Roman emperors, and that the one from Constantinople should rule both territories, or, well, that Odoacer would rule what was left of the West, basically just parts of Italy at this point, for him. And people at the time didn't think that Rome had fallen. They didn't see an era as having ended. Barbarian generals had been playing a big role in Italian politics for decades at this point, and in fact, most historians believe that Romulus Augustulus himself, being just a child when he took the throne, was just a stand-in for his father Orestes, who, as a non-Roman general himself, couldn't have been emperor. What Odoacer had simply done was gotten rid of what was by then a merely symbolic position, his seizure of power justified as an internal Roman affair. Or, as my professor put it, quote, The fall of Rome in 476 was an illusion. It was manufactured to serve the propaganda purposes of later Romans. And what were these purposes? Well, Odoacer's successors became so successful in revitalizing Roman Italy that they soon bumped up against the borders of eastern Rome. And by the time of Emperor Justinian, the court in Constantinople decided its agents in Italy had gotten just a little bit too rambunctious and wanted to take back control for itself. To justify this, a historical narrative was created in which Odoacer was now no longer seen as acting on the behalf of Romans, but as the destroyer of western Rome because if his descendants were just Roman vassals, why attack him? If, however, they were barbarian usurpers, well, then the court at Constantinople could push for an invasion of Italy as a Roman reconquest, which is exactly what Justinian did. Unfortunately, his reconquest was not to last long. 
Constantinople lost much of Italy to the Lombards only shortly after it had retaken Rome. And in this, Justinian's propaganda would have an unintended consequence. By the beginning of the 8th century, the Roman imperial court in Constantinople still controlled parts of southern Italy, some coastal areas and cities like Rome and Ravenna. At this time, the bishop of Rome, the pope, is still living in a city that's under the protection of the eastern Roman imperial court. But when the erstwhile capital of the Western Roman Empire, Ravenna, is conquered by the Lombards in 739, Pope Gregory III no longer sees his position as secure and begins to look for new political partners who can protect him. The Pope, in other words, has become an independent political player in early medieval Italy. To protect himself from the Lombards, he turns to the Franks, the new political powerhouse in Western Europe. He manages to make a deal with their king, Pippin, in exchange for anointing Pippin as king of the Franks and announcing him as patrician of the Romans, Pippin intervenes in Italy against the Lombards and, after decisively defeating them in battle, hands over the lands he had just taken to the Pope, who declares them part of the Roman Republic, a political entity based in Rome, of which he is in charge. But then, what about the Roman Empire? whose seat was in Constantinople and which still controlled parts of southern Italy. The Pope found a simple solution. He started calling them Greeks. Now, Greek was the spoken language in the areas controlled by the Roman Empire at this point, but it had been spoken there since these areas were conquered by the Romans centuries ago. That had never made them any less Roman. But when the Pope again needed help from the Franks and the Roman Emperor based in Constantinople, Constantine VI, was deposed by his mother Irene, the Pope again made use of Justinian's argument that there was no more Roman emperor to crown Pippin's son Charlemagne as Roman emperor. Thus, the stage was set for what became known as the Holy Roman Empire to claim to follow in ancient Rome's footsteps, and for the Roman Empire in Constantinople to slowly fade from our historical consciousness, to become something different. Byzantium. How did this come about? Why do we think of the Roman Empire that survived an unbroken lineage from the founding of the Roman Republic to its final destruction in 1453 as something different? Who, in other words, created this conception that the Byzantine Empire was something different, something not Roman? The answer, it turns out, lies with the historians of the early modern era, men whose motivations were based on their current circumstances, which made use of antiquity for their own ends. And for these, they turn to the new answer to that old question of whose land is this land? Part 3. The Byzantine Empire Never Existed What is Byzantium? It's a question well worth asking, because... Even as a history student, I've never really thought about it all that much. Well, first of all, Byzantion was the name of a city on the Bosporus, that's the straits linking the Black Sea to the Mediterranean, which had been established by Greek settlers in the 7th century BC. Much later, the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great chose it to become his capital city and renamed it after himself, Constantinople. But to me, the name is most associated with the Byzantine Empire, or Byzantium, and to me, to my preconceptions shaped by the society that I grew up in, Byzantium isn't a part of antiquity. But it's also not really a part of the Middle Ages either. So why? Why does this political and cultural entity defy categorization even if it's simply to fit it into an era? Maybe that's the first rabbit hole to go down. First of all, let's try to figure out when antiquity ends in general. Two not necessarily recent but still foundational books on late antiquity are Late Antiquity from Constantine to Justinian by German historian Heinz Bellin and The History of Late Antiquity, The Roman Empire from Diocletian to Justinian by Alexander de Mant. Both books are still standard literature in the class on late antiquity at the University of Vienna. And what stands out immediately? Both end with Justinian. Fortunately, I've also got another book about Justinian at home, Rome Resurgent. War and Empire in the Age of Justinian by Peter Heather is an attempt to cover the whole reign of Justinian in a single volume. 
And it turns out Justinian's reign is seen by many historians as the last gasp of the Roman Empire, but ultimately also as the last overextension of its resources. Justinian's military campaigns in North Africa and Italy, his simultaneous wars in the East, as well as the weakening of the empire by the disease that swept through the empire during his reign, what we know today as the Justinianic Plague, the first time the plague disease came to the Mediterranean, were simply too many crises at once. After Justinian's death, the empire began to crumble, the final nail in its coffin being the conquest of the Levant and Egypt by the Arabs in the 7th century. But Peter Heather partly contradicts this thesis. It's worth going into in more detail. In order to fight his wars in North Africa and Italy, Justinian had to move troops there from the east, leaving his Levantine holdings weakened against outside attack. When the Sassanid great king invaded them, Justinian was faced with a two-front war. Remember, the Sassanids were an empire which hailed from modern-day Iran, but at the time were fighting with the Roman Empire over Mesopotamia and the Levant. So, Justinian was faced with a two-front war. To make matters worse, that's when the plague started spreading. A common conception of events is that in order to maintain his army, Justinian depleted the empire's resources and suffocated its population in taxes. Heather, however, disagrees, citing several reasons. Firstly, Justinian had already raised taxes before this crisis. His successful reconquest of Carthage had strengthened his rule domestically, which gave him the political wiggle room to introduce these taxes. There were complaints against it, but none of them metastasized into a major revolt. Secondly, Heather argues that evidence of an economic downturn only shows up in the 7th century, and then mainly in the areas affected by the wars against the Sassanids and the Arabs. So then how come the Sassanids and the Arabs were able to conquer Egypt, Palestine, and Syria? Well, when Justinian died in 565, he'd worked out a peace treaty with the Sassanids, which was supposed to last for the next 50 years. Unsurprisingly, not long after his death, conflicts provoked by his successors broke out, and there were several wars that lasted until 602. But it was the intensity of the fighting that came after 602 and lasted until 627 that ended up weakening both empires. During this time, Rome briefly lost all its provinces from Asia Minor to Egypt. Constantinople itself was even besieged for a little while. Now, while Emperor Heraclius was able to regain control of all these provinces by 629, he only was able to do so at a high price. By the end of the war, the Roman provinces from Asia Minor to Egypt had been comprehensively looted and vandalized, as were the Sassanid territories, and at the end of the conflict, the economies of both empires were severely weakened. Before either of them could recover, the Arab launched their campaigns against them both. So, while Heraclius had managed to regain the territories Rome had lost to the Sassanids, by 642, the Eastern Roman Empire had again lost Syria, Palestine, and Egypt. The Sassanian Empire was completely wiped out. According to Heather, the destruction of Asia Minor and the loss of the remaining provinces in the east probably cost Constantinople 65-75% to 75 of its tax revenues. And although we should be cautious with figures like these, this was still clearly a huge loss to the empire. The Roman Empire reacted to this new status quo with administrative changes. Rome still needed a lot of soldiers, but couldn't pay them anymore. So the court at Constantinople had to create a new fiscal military structure for the state it ruled in order for it to function. Soldiers' pay was reduced and no longer handed out in gold but in silver, to compensate for which more land was set aside for people who enlisted in the military. And this all was a system that required fewer bureaucrats to oversee its functioning, and thus there was no longer a need to remove large amounts of cash around. There were also other factors at play. It was also at this time that Latin disappeared as the official administrative and legal language, with Greeks stepping in to fill the role. Emperors weren't referred to by their Latin titles anymore, but by the Greek word basileos. The newly renamed emperors also began to portray themselves increasingly as the rulers of a people chosen by God, who is the stronghold against the enemies of Christianity. Heather thus concludes that the reasons for the decline of the Roman Empire can be found in the military strategies and ensuing administrative changes enacted by Justinian's successors, not by the man himself. This theory that the reign of Emperor Heraclius represents the transition from Roman to Byzantine emperorship is one which many historians agree with. And I think this is our first clue. 
Whether it was during Justinian or his successor's reign isn't as important right now. What matters is that modern research sees this period as the end of antiquity, and the beginning of the Byzantine Empire because of the administrative changes the empire enacted after the loss of its richest territories, which had been under Roman rule for a solid 700 years. Now, there's one change that sticks out in my mind, the increased role of the Christian church. Heather mentions the stronger role that faith played in the identity of East Roman populace and its rulers. Misha Meyer also touches on this in his 1,500-page volume, History of the Great Migrations, Europe, Asia, and Africa from the 3rd to 8th century CE. Meyer argues that at this time, a liturgization of society and imperial administration was taking place. To put that into plain English, religion was seeping into all areas of life. According to Meyer, people's day-to-day existence was increasingly characterized by expression of their own piety, such as processions or communal public prayers. The state itself also changed as more and more churches were built, and the emperor was endowed with a greater religious aura, seeing itself as a Christian fortress protecting Christendom against barbarian threats. The wars, the heavy loss of life, the epidemic that racked the empire in 541 and 542, together with numerous earthquakes, made the population of the empire feel like they were living in a time of perpetual crisis. And back in that time, Christians were also still expecting the world to end within their lifetimes, thinking Jesus would return and that final judgment would be enacted upon everyone and everything. Now, for this, multiple years had been proposed to herald the end of the world, but When the same was said for the years around 500 and the last judgment failed to materialize, this threw a wrench in how people had been making sense of the world around them. The multiple ongoing crises couldn't be classified as precursors to final doom anymore. This led to religious conflicts and the Christian faith was criticized. Seen against this backdrop, the plague becomes a final point of accumulation of all the things that people saw as having gone wrong. All the crises beforehand were taught by this devastating new disease. Meyer even sees the sheer survival of the Roman Empire as a great achievement of late antique Roman society. Over the course of the 6th century, there's also an increase in the veneration of the Virgin Mary. Icons are now venerated as well, and the person of the empire was subjected to increased sacralization. According to Meyer, something which can be called Byzantine culture or Byzantine society emerged as the endpoint of this process of social change in the late 6th to early 7th century. Christian themes replaced what we would recognize as classically antique imagery in the arts. The office of consul was abolished in 541, and masses began to be held before battles. Emperors like Heraclius increasingly relied on staging themselves as the executors of divine will in order to legitimize their rule. So, now we know how modern scholars distinguish the ancient Roman Empire from the Byzantine Empire, and that they see it as something different or new. And there are fiscal, military, and religious reasons for this. But in doing so, I feel like we've lost track of something. Who the people at the time thought was Roman. Let's return to the story of the Pope, the court at Constantinople, and the Franks. In the year 800, Charlemagne was crowned emperor in Rome by the Pope. The empire that he went on to found would become known as the Holy Roman Empire, famously denounced as being neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire by the early modern French philosopher Voltaire. It's a joke that you've probably heard before if you've ever hung out with history nerds, but in light of what we've just learned, it demands a little more investigation. The refutation to its claim of being Roman is clear. Charlemagne wasn't Roman, he was a Frank. He didn't rule an empire from the city of Rome, and there already was a Roman Empire ruling from Constantinople, right? Well, kind of. Let's take a closer look. While the Frankish kingdom and its new ruling dynasty of the Carolingians, named so after Charlemagne, after his death, were consolidating their power over Western continental Europe, the Pope's new Roman Republic in Italy and the Eastern Roman Empire were struggling. In Constantinople, Constantine VI deposed his legal guardian mother Irene in 790, only to be overthrown by her in 797. Blinded, he spent the rest of his life in exile. Irene now ruled independently in Constantinople. So, was there a Roman emperor at the time of Charlemagne's coronation? Meanwhile, the new Pope Leo III was forced to flee from Rome after followers of his predecessor briefly imprisoned him. 
Charlemagne, on the other hand, was busily expanding Aachen into his new city of residence, using columns and marble from the old imperial capital city of Ravenna to build himself a cathedral. He also gave Aachen a new name, Roma Ventura, future Rome. Partly built from the remains of the last capital of the Western Roman emperors, does it need to get more obvious than this to illustrate his imperial ambitions? Not only did Charlemagne hold Rome itself, nominally at least, it was de facto governed by the Pope who made himself a willing vassal to the king, he was also building his own Rome up in the north, and there wasn't any competition to the title of emperor of the Romans at the moment. The only thing that was missing was a way for him to actually become emperor. Because remember, the last Western Roman emperor was probably just a puppet for his father, who couldn't become emperor because he was a barbarian general. What was needed was a way to justify making a Frank the emperor of the Romans. For the medieval papacy, the answer was simple, forging documents. This wasn't anything new, it had been widespread for a while now. The Pope simply said that he had found a document called the Donation of Constantine, which the Roman emperor of the same name had supposedly made to the Pope when he moved his capital from Rome to the city it just named after himself, Constantinople. According to this donation, Constantine handed over the empire, as well as the emperor's ship and imperial insignia to the Pope for safekeeping. In other words, the popes possessed the power to proclaim Roman emperors, no matter their personal background. All the pieces were now in place. The only thing that was missing was an occasion. It was Christmas Day of the year 800, during Christmas Mass, when Pope Leo III solemnly crowned Charlemagne Emperor of the Romans. The annals of the Monastery of Lorsch, a contemporary source, justify this action with the exact arguments we just discussed. To quote, Since the title of emperor had become extinct among the Greeks, and a woman claimed the imperial authority, it seemed to Pope Leo and to all the Holy Fathers who were present at the council that Charles, read Charlemagne, King of the Franks, ought to be named emperor, for he held Rome itself, where the Caesars were always accustomed to reside, and also other cities in Italy, Gaul, and Germany. End quote. Charlemagne now saw himself as the rightful successor to the Roman emperors, and the empire in the east as a Greek one that had abandoned its Roman traditions. So that was Byzantium. And to this day we treat it as a Greek entity, and not a Roman one. Am I right now? <laughs> well, no. I'm still wrong. There's something else to this story. See, there are four contradictory sources on the coronation of Charlemagne. The aforementioned report from the Annals of Lorsch, a report in the Liber Pontificalis, the Book of the Popes, kept by the Curia, and two others by authors close to Charlemagne's court. If we take a closer look at all of them, maybe we can decipher what Charlemagne wanted. The Annals of Lorsch begins with the already quoted paragraph about the female emperorship in the East, and that Charlemagne must therefore be appointed emperor. But there's a problem with this description. Not only do the monks write about a different year, 801 and not 800, but they also don't really speak about a coronation, but an anointing. And those are two different things. See, a coronation means putting a crown on someone's head. Anointing, on the other hand, doesn't need a crown. It's a religious ceremony in which someone becomes king by putting holy water or oil on them. The Annals of Lorsch say that the Christian people of Rome begged Charlemagne to accept this title, and the king finally indulged them. The Liber Pontificalis, on the other hand, portrays the event as a true coronation. The Pope takes center stage and puts a crown on Charlemagne's head. And now remember, the Liber Pontificalis, the book of the popes, was kept at the Curia in Rome and so probably recorded events the way that the Pope wanted things to be remembered. In their version of the story, they're not just blessing him spiritually, they're the ones giving Charlemagne his imperial title. And how did the man himself want the event to go down in history? Well, that itself is difficult to say because the two texts from sources close to him are themselves contradictory. On the one hand, the so-called Reichsanalen, written at the court in Aachen, present Charlemagne praying at the tomb of Peter and Paul before the Pope coronates him. But after that, the Pope kneels before Charlemagne according to the custom of the old, read Roman, emperors. Does this mean that the Pope went down on his knees before the new emperor, like the Christian patriarch of Constantinople did at the Byzantine court at the time? Well, maybe. The other source, 
Charlemagne's Vita, written by a close advisor to Charlemagne called Einhard, portrays Charlemagne as being surprised by the actions of the Pope and never wanted to become emperor. If he could have foreseen the intention of the Pope to anoint him as emperor, he never would have stepped inside that church that day. Einhard also mentions the emperors in Constantinople and how Charlemagne deals with them by calmly accepting their anger and calling them brothers. Okay, what? Well, this last text was written later than all the others, in 812, at a time when the Franks and the Byzantines were in the midst of peace negotiations. It made sense for Charlemagne to not portray himself as the driving force behind being crowned emperor if he was negotiating with a person who wouldn't have been a fan of someone else getting his title. But it only made sense for Charlemagne to want to rewrite history in this way if he actually still saw the emperors in Constantinople as real Roman emperors. Think about it. If he didn't think they were Romans, he wouldn't have tried to appease them about taking their title. He simply wouldn't have cared and declared them as being the fake Romans, not him. But Charlemagne doesn't do this. He doesn't see himself as better than the Eastern Romans. In fact, he calls them his brothers, which sounds more like he wanted to be seen as an equal by them. Well, if that's what he wanted, that's what he got. The peace treaty between the Franks and the East Romans served as an explicit recognition of Charlemagne's imperial title by the only other person in the world who held that title. And it did so. A Latin text by acclaiming Charlemagne emperor using the Greek word basileos, the one that the emperors in Constantinople had only recently switched over to, away from the Roman Latin title of imperator. And this text wouldn't have said this if Charlemagne hadn't been okay with it, if he hadn't wanted it. Clearly, Charlemagne didn't believe that Byzantium wasn't Roman. But if it wasn't under Charlemagne, the beginning of the time when there were two different Roman empires, that people began to categorize the East Romans as Byzantines and not as Romans, when did it begin? Well, once again, our quest leads us back to historiography. And here we need to make quite a large jump to the modern period, to the Middle East, or, as it was known back then by the Europeans, the Orient. In 1978, Palestinian historian Edward Said published a book simply entitled Orientalism. This was an intellectual broadside attack on the way Europeans imagined the Middle East. Said showed how a discourse had been started in Europe in the early modern era, which described the Middle East and North Africa as an other to Europe. They did this by calling it the Orient, a name imposed from outside the region it was meant to describe, an exonym, as that's known in the human sciences, the opposite being an endonym, a word someone uses to refer to themselves. But more than that, Europeans, having now created a region in their minds with a perceived homogeneous culture, proceeded to label this other with all the prejudices their imperial ambitions towards the area projected onto it. In this sense, the term Orientalism became not just a categorization of the world into two spheres, but also a tool of the powers that be in the world at the time. And this idea, this concept that exonyms can be applied to whole regions and end up shaping the way people view these regions from outside, has been applied to other areas as well. Maria Todorova has argued that the idea of a region called the Balkans was similarly created from outside the region, and that the term has been used by outsiders to funnel their prejudices about the people in the region into a term with which they can group them together and identify them as inferior. Not only was there an Orientalism, there was also a Balkanism in modern European academia. Then, in 2022, Yanis Sturaitis edited a volume of the Edinburgh Byzantine Studies and opened his contribution to the volume by asking a simple question. Is Byzantium an Orientalism? Quote, it's well known that Byzantinists, whenever addressing a broader audience, often feel obliged to clarify that there never was a Byzantine Empire. End quote. And that's just the first sentence. Soritis goes on to argue that the term Byzantine, which often carries negative connotations, is nothing more than a construct of intellectuals from the Enlightenment. The narrative begins with one of the most important figures in the historiography of antiquity, Edward Gibbon, 
the 18th century historian's monumental work, The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, is among the best-known books in the field, if not outside it. But within this grand, sweeping narrative that Gibbon paints, he constructs a division between the world of antiquity and the Byzantine Empire. To quote the man himself, But the subjects of the Byzantine Empire, who assume and dishonor the names of both Greeks and Romans, present a dead uniformity of abject vices, which neither softened by the weakness of humanity nor animated by the vigor of memorable crimes. End quote. So, Gibbon sees the inhabitants of this empire worthy of being called neither Romans nor Greeks, which reminds me of the fact that when Charlemagne and the popes of the 8th century referred to the East Roman Empire as not being Roman, they substituted the label Roman with the label Greek. But Gibbon doesn't want to grant them this title either. So, why? Well, according to Gibbon, the Byzantine culture was decadent, and its citizens were not as free as the people of ancient Athens. And this is where we find our second important clue to what's going on here. At this time in history, the 18th and 19th century, Europeans were looking back to ancient Rome and ancient Greece as a golden age of quote-unquote European culture. The study of Greco-Roman culture was institutionalized at universities in what we call today the discipline of classics. Remember, this is a discipline different to history, and it's the reason why I wasn't allowed to study ancient Rome or ancient Greece in Dublin. Scholars of the so-called Enlightenment saw in this age the foundation of modern European civilization and a possible way to break free from the corset of seeing the Church as the leading agent of European history. They wanted to show that the Greeks and the Romans were the foundations of European civilization. Which, I might add, is heavily ironic, considering that neither of these cultures were European civilizations. The more accurate descriptor would be Mediterranean civilizations, it was one of the big changes of the Middle Ages that the Mediterranean became split in two, the North and the West becoming Christian, the South and the East becoming Muslim. It was only in the early modern era that academics like Gibbon began using the term European civilization. The term that one had used in the Middle Ages was Christendom. The Eastern Roman Empire, however, with its capital of Constantinople situated right on the sea straits which separated Europe and Asia Minor, remained an empire of the Mediterranean and was about to be ousted from European history. Gibbon's debarkation has had, and continues to have, a huge influence on the academic study of what Sturaitis chooses to instead refer to as the medieval East Roman world. While it's always been easy for historians to agree on when the Byzantine Empire ended, the capture of Constantinople on the 29th of May, 1453, by the Ottoman Empire, it's harder to define when it began. We've already looked at this problem. The solutions proposed by historians like the contraction of the empire and the ensuing administrative changes in the 7th century, the cultural changes like the increasing importance of religion in the state, the list goes on and on, but Sturaitis offers a different explanation for why there has been no consent. Soraitis says that what we've got in our hands here isn't a problem of periodization. Rather, it is an attempt to preserve an idealized image of classical Greco-Roman culture and obscure any continuity to what early modern European scholars saw as a quote-unquote medieval mutation. Soraitis stresses the importance of the otherness of Byzantium. By seeing it as something qualitatively different to ancient Rome, early modern Europeans could see themselves and their emerging Western European kingdoms as the true heirs of the ancient civilizations which they so admired. And as the East Roman Empire was centered on the Bosporus, the point of connection between the emerging separate civilizations of Europe and the Middle East and North Africa, it was easy to see it as something different. This framework which Gibbon created structured the way that academics thought about Rome and East Rome. Even those who rejected his narrative of Byzantium as an inferior version of Rome, not even worthy of its own name, still remained within the structure that Gibbon had created, that there was a qualitative difference between the ancient pan-Mediterranean Roman Empire and the part of the Roman Empire that survived into the Middle Ages in the Eastern Mediterranean. In the 19th century, when Greek nationalist historiography was in its infancy, nationalist historians sought to prove that the modern Greek state, which had only become independent in 1812, possessed a direct link to Greek's ancient past, 
a link from which Western European scholars excluded the Byzantine era. In other words, Greek nationalist historians bought into the idea of Western European historians that basically Byzantium equals bad. Now, those Greek historians who disagreed with them tried to prove that the Byzantine Empire was in parts Greek in its culture and should be seen as a bearer of Greek identity. In other words, it could only be good if it was in fact Greek. At the end of the day, though, none of them broke free from the structure created by the scholars of the Enlightenment by Gibbon. To deconstruct the negative image of the Byzantine Empire, all they did was try to prove continuities from the ancient Greco-Roman world idealized by early modern Europeans. They never stopped to think that Byzantium itself was a construct, that it had actually been a part of an ancient Roman continuity which stretched back all the way to the founding of the city of Rome. Now, I can understand that Greek nationalist historians fell for this. As nationalist historians are wont to do, they were trying to project their ethnicity back into the past, trying to prove that the Byzantine Empire was Greek, not Roman, a statement with which, ironically, the popes of the 8th century would mostly agree with. Which highlights an important point. How did the inhabitants of this polity actually conceive of their identity themselves? Now, this might disappoint you after all this time of me giving you background, but the answer is very simple. The citizens of the empire, which we now call Byzantium, called themselves Romans. Romaios, in their native Greek language. They called their state the Roman Empire. And it is this simple fact that modern historians continue to ignore when they keep referring to them as Byzantines. To quote the Greek historian Anthony Caldelis, as an ideological construct of the Western imagination, Byzantium was shorn of its Roman identity already in medieval times. The dominant conceit in the medieval West was that the majority population of the Eastern Empire were not Romans, as they claimed, but rather Greeks. This at least recognized that they had an ethnic identity, even if it was mislabeled for political purposes. This tradition of Roman denialism then passed directly from medieval prejudice into modern scholarship, where it continues to fester. In the 19th century, moreover, these medieval Greeks were stripped of ethnicity and became deracinated Byzantines. Roman denialism is today one of the pillars of Byzantine studies. Whereas visitors from outside the field can easily see that the primary sources speak clearly of a Roman ethnicity, most experts within the field continue to deny the obvious, sometimes zealously asserting various pretexts, denials, and risable arguments by which to assert that the Byzantines were not really the Romans which they claimed to be. In some scenarios, Roman was allegedly just an empty label, a relic of past imperial glory or crusty antiquarianism, or it was a hollow piece of political propaganda, or an act of deception performed by a few elites for some reason, or a meaningless claim made by a population that was deluding itself, or it was equivalent to orthodoxy, that is, the version of Christianity practiced in the East Roman Empire, or any alternative that might avoid the ethnic implications that stare us in the face through so many sources, genres, and contexts, both social and geographical. The modern reading of Byzantine identity as religious and even metaphysical makes sense only after it has been stripped of its Romanness by self-interested Western medieval powers and then stripped of its distorted alter ego, Greek ethnicity, by scholars in the 19th century. End quote. A bit long, I know, but I couldn't have said that better myself. Because, see, what this is really about is ethnicity. Not nationalism, because remember, that's a modern construct. It's about ethnicity and our ability to choose for ourselves how we are defined. Byzantium shows how important it is to differentiate between what people call themselves and what others call them. That's the strange-sounding academic term that I introduced earlier on. Exonym. It means a word used to describe someone which they don't use to describe themselves. And that's what Byzantium is. That's what Byzantinism is. A term not chosen by the people themselves, but by scholars. Scholars who force a narrative of otherness, shaped by the political ideas and interests of the Middle Ages and the Enlightenment. The idea of Rome existing in the Middle Ages didn't fit into the story that early modern Europeans were trying to tell about themselves, a story about their heroic origins, their founding myth of a collective civilizational golden age which was destroyed and to which they were the rightful heirs. Because if we allow Byzantium to be Rome, then the Europe of the modern era was never the Renaissance 
or to call that term by its English word, the rebirth of ancient culture. It becomes something else, something doubtlessly influenced by what this ancient culture had left it, but also something that saw a time long past that it admired, wanted to relive, wanted to be a part of, and therefore inserted itself into. So the obvious end point to all of this is the question, should we stop using the word Byzantium? Well, the historians I've talked about is criticizing the term. Their focus is what is called Byzantine studies. And they don't want to end the academic field itself. What they would probably say is that we should rethink where our categorization of Byzantinism comes from and how such narratives of exclusion have had an influence on how we see history and how we see our place in it. This podcast was written and researched by Tobias Hübel. It was recorded and edited by me, Coleman Marshik. The music was composed by Matthias Cantini and all artwork was designed by Andrew Holt.